Someone told me long ago There's a calm before the storm And I know it's been coming for some time When it's over, so they say It'll rain a sunny day And I know shining down like water Have you ever seen the rain? And I want to know, have you ever seen the rain? Coming down on a sunny day. Yesterday and days before, the sun is cold and rain is hard, and I know time till forever on it goes through the circle fast and slow and I know it can't stop I wonder I, I want to know have, have you ever seen the rain, rain? I want to know have you ever seen the rain coming down on a sunny day? I want to know, have you ever seen the rain? And I want to know, have you ever seen the rain coming down? Well, we are here to be church to one another, to sing and to pray and to hear God's hope and to see God's light shining forth in every single person in this room and on the screen and in our hearts today. So as we gather ourselves for worship, we invite you to stand as you're able and join us in our opening. Uh, the refrain will be on the screen or also the lyrics are in your hands too. We are one. We are how we treat each other when the day is done. We are peace. We are war. We are how we treat each other. We're going to sing another hymn. I knew that. All right. So please join us in singing our opening hymn, Water is Life. This comes from the um, protest movement at Standing Rock. You know it from a prayer refrain. Now we're going to sing a bunch of verses. So join in. All my relations come. Every nation come. All my relations under the sun, we are one. We are praying, come. We are praying, come. We are the song and we are the drum. We are one. We are the new day, run, run, run. We are the new day, run, run. We are the old and we are the young. We are one. We are the earth and sky. We are the thunder cries. We are the fire. We are the light in your eyes. We are standing strong. <clears throat> like a rock, like a stone. On the sacred ground we belong, we are. 
our home. We come young and old to be reminded that we are one indeed. Thankful for this community where we try to live that out with comfort and challenge each week. The peace of God be with you all. Please share a sign of God's peace with those around you. Peace, peace. Good to see you all. Peace, peace. Thank you for being with us. Good to have you. Yeah, you can be seated. It's wonderful as ever to see you all up there on the Zoom screen. We're saying hello to you. We hope it's a lovely, cool summer day wherever you are and that you are well as well. Um, it is a gift to be together. Thank you so much for showing up. We make this church with one another, so your presence here is a gift. We want to know you're here, so if you'll pass the green books down, and that's a good place to let us know if there are joys or concerns that we're not aware of, and the same in the chat. Um, you can also make your offering um, at the baskets or online. We appreciate your gifts. They make possible so many things, including our children's program, where we have staff now that are working with the kids and helping the kids grow in their faith and reach out into the world in really powerful ways. So thank you for your support. Um, we have a lot going on right now in our church family, lots of things to celebrate, including folks continuing to travel. It's good to have Ben's parents here, Peter and Lynn from Schenectady, both of them pastors up there, retired pastors. So thank you so much for being with us. Um, we have kids and students going back to school, and we had a wonderful celebration at Cherith Brook on Thursday night. I think many of you were there as you celebrated all the work that's been done in the community with people who are living close to the street for the last 20 years with Jody and Eric's leadership. And we have a lot of concerns too. Um, Mark Williams is gonna have surgery on Tuesday and we'll be thinking of you and hope that your hospital stay is not a full five days, but we'll be praying for you and Diane. Um, our Ed Brennan today was supposed to be a service for Charlene who passed away about a month ago and instead had to be canceled because Ed has gone into rehab with COVID and some other things. So really difficult time. They've had such a long, rich marriage and a difficult time. Ruth Riggs' sister is near the end of death and has now been moved to a different hospice. So challenging time there. George, Judy Bordeaux's cousin, some of you may have sent that. We sent this out that he was in. There come the Garbison, speaking of the Cherithbrook celebration. Um, the, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, 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 Judy's cousin in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania had stopped to help someone who was in need and the person shot him many times, but he is expected to be okay, but it's been kind of all over the Pittsburgh, P Pennsylvania news about this good Samaritan and sadly the person just mentally ill and too much access to weapons, right? So we continue to work for a different world. And then we remember that our sweet Kay Ward who died almost two years ago of cancer would be 58 today and know that's a tender time for those of you who called her daughter and sister and all of us who loved her dearly um we have many needs in the world um i've been thinking about my own um i don't know if it'd be news avoidance or complicity or inaction probably the first 200 days 150 days of the war in gaza i was much more active and speaking and on a daily call about it and talking about it and preaching and i realized in the last three months just haven't said much and I think um, we're going to talk about that, kind of looking at the scripture and looking at some thinkers who have helped us think about what is behind what sometimes we call compassion fatigue, but maybe compassion collapse. And how do we kind of help, how do we help challenge that in our own lives, not just in big ways, whether it's what's going on in Ukraine too. And again, you may have seen yesterday, a hundred people were killed in Gaza and strike on a school. There've been something like 17 schools struck, struck this month. Um, but in our own things, in our own stuff, when we do feel overwhelmed with the challenges in front of us and in our own small circles, and how do we, as opposed to kind of retreat, how do we live out of our power and face that as fully as we can? So thankful for this community, which helps us and encourages us every single week to be the people God has created us to be. Let us join in our call to prayer. Shines a light on me, opens up my eyes so I can see. When I look up in the darkest night, then I know everything's gonna be alright. Whenever God shines a light on me, opens up my eyes so I can see. darkest night then I know everything's gonna be alright oh 
awesome mystery and loving source of all that is, I and those gathered here know you best through the one who is your child, the child who is one with us and one with you. Through Jesus, we have all heard that you are ever present. Listen, I am standing at the door knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and eat with you and you with me. Help us, help me, to silence my busy brain enough to be aware of the knock on the door of my heart and to hear your voice above all the buzz that distracts me. Calm the anxiety swirling within me, stirred by the chaotic world that we have created, so that I might open the door, open my heart so that I might share intimate fellowship with you. I long not simply to know things about you, but to know you, to experience your presence and your love. Help me to be still, not only to know that you are God, but simply to know you. I thank you for your patience and love. I thank you that you have not walked away from the door of my heart. I am grateful that it is in you that I live and breathe and have my being, and you, and that you are always longing for me to know you better. Thank you, my Lord. Amen. Whenever God shines a light on me, opens up my eyes so I can see. When I look up in the darkest night, then I know everything's gonna be all right. An old pastor and one young pastor. And, you know, I'm just not really hip with all this stuff, but we are trying to make this a place where people can hear. So we're trying to deal with all of this, so we appreciate it. And for those of you who didn't hear, um, our sweet Eric Wilson was are gonna be our musician until this morning a few hours ago when his wife tested positive for COVID. So we're super appreciative of Eric's preparation and work all week and sorry and hope that Ellen, who's a school teacher, gets to feeling better super soon. And we do appreciate Christian so much for jumping in at the very last minute. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. So our lesson this morning comes from Mark 6. We're kind of going back. This was really a couple of weeks ago lesson, but we got off. But remember, last week we had the beheading of John the Baptist, which was kind of an insertion into the story. But before that, um, the disciples had just been kind of commissioned and sent out and given a task by Jesus. And we had heard that they had... Um, cured many and anointed many and they just done a dadgum good job so now they have come back and they are reporting to jesus on that and they're also tired the apostles gathered around jesus and told him all that they had done and taught jesus said to them come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while for many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat and they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves, or privately, the Greek is. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, Jesus went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. It was an upsetting story. It was about Thursday in Gaza. There had been an Israeli attack in Khan Yunus, and at least 27 people had been killed, including a mother and her four, four children who had been, as the story said, incinerated in their tent. And the story went on to say that now the count was around 39,667 people who have been, whose bodies have been recovered. But the part that really upset me was not the almost 40,000, but the mother and her four children. That's how our brains really just work. There's a term for that a concept called psychic numbing. Um, Paul Slovic, who teaches at University of Oregon, has studied genocide and famine and disaster and how we respond or don't respond. And he says, you know, our lack of response is not just that we're heartless and callous. There are reasons. There are reasons why nations don't really respond, right, to genocide because it's 
dangerous, it's difficult, it's costly, it's risky. And then there are reasons that we don't really respond as the numbers escalate. And one of those is this somewhat familiar idea of psychic numbing, like as numbers escalate, our feelings don't escalate. In fact, sometimes our feelings actually decrease. So if I say, you know, hey, there's a little child and a little, she's maybe seven, and now there's a, you know, camera on her and she's floating off the coast of Greece. You know, she's a refugee. Somehow she got separated from the boat. She's just out there on this tiny piece of plywood. I mean, her hearts break for her and the rescue operation. But then if you hear, well, there's actually two little ones. You're more concerned, but you're not twice as concerned, right? And three and four. And then by the time you go from there's 87 children to 88, you just don't really have much difference between how you feel about 87 or 88, right? So if I say, you know, there's 600,000 people right now at risk of famine in the Sudan. Actually, it's 700,000. I mean, we don't feel any different between 600 and 700,000, right? It's just we can't really comprehend that. It's just our, our emotions just don't work that way. But there's something else he writes about that I think is less explored and really helpful, and it's what he calls pseudo inefficacy. <laughs> Am I saying it right? It means like we have a false sense of our own ineffectiveness. We have a false sense of our powerlessness. So we don't act sometimes when we can act because we're overwhelmed by the numbers. So a simple little study kind of shows this. They did like a study of college kids in Sweden. They showed them a picture of a little girl. They said, hey, would you contribute this little girl is at risk of starvation? You know, a lot of the college kids, yeah, I'll help. Then they showed them the same picture of the little girl, exact same picture, she's at risk of starvation, and then next to it a slide, she's one of millions who are at risk. How many people will contribute? I mean, a smaller number. You know, at first they thought, well, more people, because wow, you can see how big the problem is. But what scholars talk about is that when we help someone, we have this warm glow feeling, right? You help people, to be honest, we all, I mean, because we feel good, right? We, you know, we know we benefit people. And, but when you see the needs are so freaking massive, then you have this negative feeling of helplessness. And so what happens is the negative feeling sort of overwhelms the warm glow. And this happens even when you go from one child to two. So they showed a picture of two children. Would you help you know, one of these two children? And even then the needs, the numbers go down. We're not the very first people to struggle with this, right? That's what we're hearing about in the scriptures. You have the disciples, they have been out teaching and healing and doing all the things. We are told they have already touched many people. They've anointed many and they've cured many. And they've, they've cast out many demons. And then, you know, they give Jesus a report and they get a promotion, right? They're called apostle now, but they're also tired. Now they're tired. And they're tired because there are many people still coming. The Greek word many shows up six times in the next six sentences, right? There are many people, there's a line, there's a throng, there's many, 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 many. There's so many, so many people don't have a chance to eat, right? I mean, people are exhausted. And so Jesus tells them, and we've already heard this many, right? Before we've heard this is a theme in Mark's gospel. Remember back in chapter two when they were carrying the paralytic, but there were so many people they couldn't get there and they had to climb up on the roof. So there's a lot of people with a lot of need. So Jesus tells them, this is what you gotta do. You gotta come away to a private place or come away by yourselves to a deserted place. And you know, when the gospel repeats something, we know we're supposed to step up. So then it's repeated again. And they came away to a deserted place privately by themselves. So the point is, you all really need to rest, right? But the deserted place would have triggered something else. That's the wilderness. So it would have been a reminder that the wilderness, where people are wandering, where people are needy, where the, you know, wandering in the wilderness, you know, even when you go to this deserted place, even when you go on vacation, even when you're on the retreat, you can't get too far away from the wilderness. You can't get too away from all the needs. No doubt, because the people in the scripture have seen where they're going, and before they can even get there, the people are already there asking for more help, right? They're already there. Oh, 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 need help me, help me, help me. So the disciples, who, as we know, don't always look great in Mark's gospel, and Brad's going to teach about that in a few weeks, the disciples here really shine. The disciples just keep their rear end in the boat, right? Jesus sees that they're tired. You know, they've got their own compassion fade, compassion collapse, whatever you want to call it. And Jesus gets out. Jesus has compassion on the people. They're like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus gets out and teaches all these people. But the, but the disciples just stay in the boat. I think there's a lesson in there, right, about balance. We talked about the boat a couple of weeks ago. Do you remember we talked about um, 
how the land and the scripture is always a, it's always a sign of promise and possibility and this safety and you know the place where you can where you go when you want to be with a friend or someone that's just place of respite and the sea in the scripture is always this place of chaos and challenge and and the boat is a way of extending the land and we talked a couple of weeks about you remember about how we are all called to kind of extend with the boat we're people to be the boat we offer to one another we offer care except for sometimes no, sometimes you just need to stay in the boat, right? It kind of is a balance. I think the Sunday after Michael's, Micah's funeral, I think I talked about this. My friend Cindy said she always looks at the congregation kind of, or looks at the world, kind of divides it in two. There are people who are just barely hanging on, just barely, because they've buried their child or they're struggling, they've lost their job, there's mental illness, there's challenges. And all of those people are like looking for a sign, looking for something to keep going. The rest of us, who are in a good spot, we're supposed to be kind of looking for the way that we can reach out and care and offer. So it's kind of a balance. Sometimes you're in the boat, sometimes you're not. But the reality is, eventually what happens? Disciples get out of the boat and help too, right? They get back out of the boat because now there's 5,000 people and nobody remembered to bring their lunch. They don't have anything to eat because they weren't thinking. And so they jump out there. And then the rest of chapter six is just a litany of many, 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 many things. So what do we do in this kind of a situation where, you know, it's easy to feel really overwhelmed? And Slovak comes up with a couple of ideas, which I don't know that are really tested, but seem to be, make a lot of sense. One of them is share your story, right? Like when you, when you know someone's story, then, you know, because there's that line, statistics are human beings with the tears dried off. I mean, when you know people's story, you get to know someone like Jennifer does from the Ukraine, or you work with people who live on the street, or you work with refugees, or you work with people who are, you know, coming out of a cancer situation, then you feel a sense of connection. You feel a sense of, you know, I want to care because now I understand. Kind of like the reason we're being the, you know, part of the reason we're bringing the refugee family here from Venezuela. It's not just because, you know, there's 67 million refugees and we're going to help one. It's also because we're going to be changed and transformed by their individual story. But then the second thing he says, which I think is kind of interesting, he's kind of riffing off that work of the economist Danny Kahneman on slow and fast thinking. We've talked about that before. Remember, like you get your slow thinking going, which is when you meet somebody and you're falling in love and you're just drinking them up and you just like every single thing and you're just, your brain is just lit up, right? Or when you're trying to learn to do something for the first time, like riding a bike, that's the expensive part of your brain. But then after you learn those things, after you, then you put people on autopilot, right? You quit listening to them. It's that fast, cheap part of your brain. So what he says here is that we kind of need to do that when we look at challenges too. We need to engage that slow, part of our brain. So an example would be harvesters right here in our own city. 45 bucks a month is what it costs to feed somebody, feed a kid. 45 bucks a month, you could feed a kid, which means a kid is gonna start school, they're gonna have enough to eat, which means they're gonna be able to think and grow and thrive. And that's not a hard thing to do. And that's kind of what harvesters encourages people to do because they help people at every single food bank. If you enter your zip code, so many things are gonna pop up. But then when you dig into the Harvester's website, and you see that there's, in our 27 county area, 109,000 kids at risk of food insecurity. And you think, well, what can my help in what, you know what, it's still one kid, right? You're still helping one kid. And that's the, that's the kind of engaging your brain to kind of help you think about it. And then his last thing is like collaborate, like let's work together. If, if a lot of us pitch in the 45 bucks, or a lot of us pitch in a little bit of it, it'll make a difference. But what I've been thinking about too is how the reason that we struggle to care is not just because there's so many problems out there, but because we've all got our own stuff. We've all got our own many, 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 many things. So one of my very dearest friends is uh, kind of like the backbone of her community with her spouse, and they are just out there doing all kinds of stuff. And she has this remarkable sense of balance. I do not know anybody with a stronger sense of balance. She's got a really rich prayer life, a rich journaling life. She's a walker. She's just built kind of, she's kind of built this world of a retreat. And they have had more issues the last 15 years than like anybody I know. They've had cancer, they've had mental illness, they've had um, addiction, they've had, and, and, and she's just kept going until a month ago. 
until a month ago when she had this situation where someone in her immediate family just tore her up and down, inside and out. I mean, you know when people say things to one another? I don't know if you've ever had that, like just in it, where you think there's no taking that back, right? I mean, there's certain things you can say to somebody that are really, really, really hard to walk back. I mean, really hard. And she was pretty devastated. So she <coughs> called her therapist. She had a meeting with a the therapist. And the first thing the therapist told her was, don't do anything for two weeks. Slow down. I thought that was interesting because I'm all over that Stan Kat Tatkin kind of wired for love. He's all about couples and when there's a breach, you want to jump in there and fix it. Which I think is probably true with couples. It doesn't matter whose fault it was. Let's just try to solve it. But maybe when it's a parent and child, nobody's going anywhere, right? You can't get rid of one another. What's two damn weeks, right? So the whole point was slow down and think and just kind of give yourself some breath, think about it. But then when she talked to the therapist two weeks later, she had her 99 concerns that she was planning to share with this family member. And she's a lot of concerns. And the therapist said, no, you share one thing, not 99, one thing. I was uncomfortable about, and I'm sorry, I was not more clear about that. You know, it's like one thing, which then again makes you stop and put your brain, your good, expensive brain on and think, what am I really concerned about here? What is really bothering me? What is it that's really, which there's something about that that's super helpful because I've been thinking again back to our own congregation. Last week, we had three young men in our church behind bars. I mean, there's a lot of, people are carrying a lot of stuff. People are carrying a lot of stuff. There's so many challenges and the resources in our country have sort of shrunk to deal with those. But when you step back and you think and you try to zero in, what's the thing that I'm most concerned about? Because when you do that, then you're also gonna have to be open to listening to the other person's story, which may or may not ring true to you, but it's their story nonetheless. And when you do that, then something else happens, which you kind of move into that. If you really wanna solve it, instead of just being right, then it becomes me and you versus the problem instead of me versus you. So I've been thinking about this a lot, about how we might in our own lives, not just back away from our power, which is considerably, but how we might step forward and embrace it. Think, what can I do in the face of ABC? It's probably why I love the Olympics so much. Because the Olympics, um, it's not just that, you know, when you're a runner, I mean, yesterday watching the end of the men's marathon, I actually wept. I mean, it's just, it's so beautiful. And to see the Americans finish eighth and ninth, I mean, it's just like to know what that, a tiny bit of what that takes. But then it's like back to being an American, don't you feel proud? I'm not talking about the medal count. I'm talking about how diverse this country is. It's so, show me the other country, right? I mean, like, how beautiful and how different and how varied we are. I mean, there's just something about that to celebrate. But then even better, you know, even better than the individual athlete, the parents and the fans and the family. Show me the athlete who doesn't have somebody up there cheering for them, right? Waving for them, kind of. And that kind of reminds you again that we're not individuals. This is all a team sport. We are all in here together. Nobody, nobody makes it on their own. But then when you dig a little further, what do you always find? All these problems in those families. Many illnesses, many injuries, depression, loss of, but people keep coming back. My friend said to me after a not so successful conversation with the family member, I keep wondering these days why it is so damn hard to love people, even the people we love. I keep wondering why it is so hard to love even the people we love. That's true. I mean, there's just something about the world we're living in right now. But if we want the world to be different, then we're gonna have to act differently and we're gonna have to think differently, right? So we're gonna have to you know, show up and think, not just how can I support this kid, but we're gonna have to think about how do we vote? How do we show up in Missouri to raise the minimum wage two bucks, to be sure that we've got you know, paid sick leave? How do we elect people who are gonna extend the child tax credit and extend, expand Medicaid? It's all of this stuff together. So the good news is this, 
the God who calls us and invites us to care for one another, who fills our lives with compassion, is finally the one who brings us together and makes it possible for us to care. So may we know wisely when it's time to rest in the boat and when it's time to get out. Amen. I have a voice Started out as a whisper Turned into a scream Made a beautiful noise Shoulder to shoulder marching in the street When you're on the mountain It's a quiet breeze But when you band together It's a choir of thunder and rain Now we have a choice Cause I have a voice I'm not living to die Don't stand in a wasteland Look at me in the eye Stop living a lie And stand up next to me You gotta put one foot in front of the other With a hand and a hand holding on to each other Go on and rejoice Cause you have a voice It is loud, it is clear It's stronger than your fear It's believing you belong It's for calling out the wrong From the silence of my sisters To the violence of my brother We can, we can rage Against the river, feel the pain of another. Cause I have a voice. I have a voice. I let it speak for the ones who aren't yet running free. It's killing me. No one's saying what we need to hear. I will not let silence win when I see all the pain our people are in. There's no other choice Cause I have a voice It is loud, it is clear It's stronger than your fears It's believing you belong It's for calling out the wrong From the mouths of our mothers To the lips of our daughters We can, we can dream like our brothers speaking loud like our fathers we can we can heal can you hear us can you hear us now i have a voice started out as a whisper turned into a scream made a beautiful noise shoulder to shoulder marching in the street when you're on the mountain, it's a quiet breeze. But when you band together, it's a choir of thunder and rain. Now we have a choice, because I have a voice. Now we have a choice, because I have a voice. So I think when we gather at this table, a big part of what we try to do is visualize the world we want to live in, right? A visualize a world where everybody's got enough to eat, where everybody's safe, where we can share with one another, where we can find healing in our own relationships and in the bigger world. Um, I've talked to you before about Peter Singer, who is that thinker who wrote the book, The Good You Can Do, who talks about the best way to help with a dollar, what you can do the most. And I've talked about this before, like with the dollar. Most important thing, you can deworm a kid and you can buy a mosquito net. Actually, a mosquito net's two bucks and deworming a kid's 59 cents. But it's a way that you can really make a difference in the world until we get that malaria vaccine everywhere. And one thing that they do is they send you, if you make a donation monthly, they send you a little thing telling you where you bought mosquito nets and what country it went to and how many people protected. And I gotta admit, I never look at that. I just like, you know, I got too much to do. So I looked at it this week, and I was like, well, I bought 13 mosquito nets. 
You know, and trying to picture, which went over 21 people, and trying to imagine, like, what it means to be able to keep your child safe, right? So some of it's visualizing, and then some of it's sharing with people how much, how much they mean to us. Like, again, taking the time to tell people how you touch one another, how the tomatoes made our salad so good, all of it, like, as a way of sharing. And, and part of that, again, is to kind of train our brain to go in a different way, to remind ourselves that this God who is always with us sees what hurts us and holds out a future of hope and invites us to share that hope with one another by offering ourselves to the world. So we remember that it was on the night of the betrayal when Christ Jesus took bread and after giving thanks broke it and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, the cup after supper, saying this cup has been poured out for the forgiveness of all sins. Drink this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. Let us pray. O oh, Holy One, as we gather at this table with a loaf of bread and a cup of juice, we dream of a world, we visualize a world that you would make so filled with your love and your goodness and your justice for all people. This is a practice we do every week. And as we do so, we invite your blessing on this bread and cup that as we share it, we might be filled with the hope and grace, the goodness of your spirit to take forth into the world and do your work. And we lift our voices together in saying the prayer that Jesus taught, our creator who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Come and feast. Come gather around people wherever you roam. And admit that the waters around you have grown. And accept it that soon you'll be drenched to the bone. If your time to you is worth saving And you better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone For the times they are a-changing Come writers and critics, prophesize with your pen Keep your eyes wide, the chance won't come again. And don't speak too soon, for the wheel's still in spin. And there's no telling of who that it's naming. For the loser now will be later to win. For the times, they are a changing. Congressmen, please heed the call. Don't stand in the doorway, don't block up the hall. For he that gets hurt will be he who has stalled. There's a battle outside and it's raging. It'll soon shake your windows and rattle your walls. For the times they are a change. Mothers and fathers throughout the land and Don't criticize what you can't understand Your sons and your daughters are beyond your command Your old road is rapidly aging Please get out of the new one if you can lend a hand For the times they It is drawn, the curse it is cast. The slow one now will later be fast, as the present now will later be past. The order is rapidly fading, and the first one now will later be last. For the times they are a change.
Please join me in prayer. Oh, gracious God, what a gift it is to join our hearts and spirits, and even if we're lucky enough, our bodies in one place, to lift our voices and to um, hear a word that fills us up, to hear a music that hopefully stirs our spirits, to hear prayers that sends us out and inspires us to do your work in this world. We thank you for this time, and we ask your presence and your comfort and your courage as we go into this week. In your name we pray. Amen. So we're going to close out, as we always do, with some singing. So we invite you to stand as you are able and join us in singing our closing, Turning of the World. Um, the lyrics are in your hand and on the screen. As a note, I think we're doing one less verse than is on the screen. It's in your hand correctly. Just uh, if you're at home, roll with it. Here we go. Let us sing this song for the turning of the world that we may turn as one. With every voice, with every song, we will move this world along and our lives will feel the echo of our turning. With every voice, with every song, we will move this world along. With every voice, with every song, along and our lives will feel the echo of our turning let us sing this song for the loving of the world that we may love as one with every voice with every song we will move this world along and our lives will feel the echo of our loving Let us sing this song for the healing of the world, that we may heal as one. With every voice, with every song, we will move this world along, and our lives will feel the echo of our healing. With every voice, with every song, we will move this world along. Along. With every voice, with every song, we will move this world along, and our lives will feel the echo of our healing. Give me love, give me love, give me peace on earth, give me light, give me life, keep me free from birth, give me hope. Help me cope with this heavy load, trying to touch and reach you with heart and soul. Oh, my Lord, please take hold of my hand that I might understand you. Give me now may God, the infinitely compassionate one, comfort us some days and challenge us others so that we might know how to care for this beautiful and bruised world. So that everywhere we go, we might be peace and wage peace and love one another. Every single other. Amen. Amen.